Welcome to the Mark J. Ryan Experience with your host, Mark J. Ryan, mind-body expert with over 25 years experience in NLP, hypnosis, and coaching, taking you on the road to self-discovery, exploring different parts of yourself, including spirituality, the latest research into the brain and the mind, and how it can help you attain more of what you want including wealth and money. Mark will be coaching you in the latest technologies of change. From interesting fields such as hypnosis, NLP, and brainwashing. You'll also learn how to improve your relationships and love life. Learn the newest techniques in sales and marketing to improve your income. You'll learn all this in an easy and fun way to understand using current events. Get ready to change your life for the better with the Mark J. Ryan Experience. On this episode, shifting values to make more money and enjoy your life more. Hey everybody, it's Mark J. Ryan and welcome to the Mark J. Ryan Experience. It's been a little bit since I've done a podcast. Had a lot going on in the meantime. We uh, put a sale on a month or so, two months ago maybe, for um, quite a significant amount off my coaching calls. I had had so many people writing me, asking me, look, I can only afford this much. Can you do it for this much if we work out this much time? And so uh, I sent it out to Kathy and said, okay, let's, I've got a little bit of time that I've set aside. I was going to go down and see uh, John Overdurf and Phoenix and something happened that did not allow me to go down there so I had some extra time I said let's go ahead and put a sale on and so we put a sale on and I got a ton of people signing up for that so I haven't been doing much of anything in between the uh, the energy I'll, I'll take a usually do a couple people a day sometimes more um, but any more than that energetically I don't feel like I'm giving the people what I can give them um, or want to give them at, at a certain point, it just gets to the, it gets tiring energetically. Cause I put so much focus, so much concentration into what the people are saying. And I'll go nor, norm, a lot longer than normal sessions go. A normal session will go anywhere from 50 minutes to an hour. And usually, um, I like to chit chat. I like to go around and see, especially the first session, see how people, how they think, about many different subjects, what their belief systems are. So I'll just do some normal chit-chat, gathering information about how they think. Then we get into the what the issue is. And one of the things I've noticed, even in the, I still do telecoaching university with uh, John Overdurf and been doing that for uh, 10 years, I think, which is uh, three times a month. Uh, we do about six hours a month, which is supervision. Uh, it's great to have um, if you're a coach, Something that you're doing, um, working with NLP, working with hypnosis, something that you can do to keep your knife sharp, so to speak, to keep your blade sharp, to know uh, what's going on, what other people think about you, and actually get out there and we do supervision calls where we'll supervise each other. So one person is the client and another one will be the supervisor, and then John basically listens to us, watches, and doesn't watch us, but listens to us, listens to our wording, how we're doing it. If he feels we're going off track or we could shortcut it, he'll stop us. So part of being a really good therapist, part of being a really good coach is the ability to continue to improve your skills. I'm reading something. I'm listening to something for at least a few hours every single day. I love it. It's not just about improving who I am and what I can do, but I just love what I'm doing. When you work with somebody and they've had something, an issue for their whole life, and then you can say one word or change one sentence. Uh, and a lot of it, like Bandler said, 80% of it is the interview and 20% is the, the change work, or I've heard it even higher. 95% is, is the setup and 5% is the actual change work. And I, I hold true to that. I like to find out and I like to get as much information, as much leverage as possible so that when we get to that magical point that something happens, and it always does, on one level or another, something happens. And I'm not willing to limit it to a certain amount of time 
because as I was saying a little bit earlier, as we go to the, the coaching calls, the supervision, we found out that there's, and through talking to different people, something magical happens right at about an hour. And it's, this is not a tried and true rule. This is a, a, what I say is a general rule. There's a certain type of momentum and rapport built up. And a lot of times the shifting and the changing that I see happens, happens between the hour and the hour and a half mark, up to 90 minutes. So I'm interested in the shift and in the change. Not to say that I haven't worked with people and within 30 minutes or half an hour, it's gone, it's shifted. And, um, you know, if people worry about their time, I'll just do some trance work or some hypnosis or we can talk or tell some stories, whatever, to uh, make sure they feel like they've got their value of time, even though really what they're paying for is change. And the reward that comes with that and knowing that, and then when you hear back from people later on, I've had a, a couple clients recently that I've worked with in the past and that have come back. I had a guy write me, what was, I can't remember if it was last night or this, this morning, and it was on Facebook, and he had said basically, he's, he did, I did some work with him back in 2006, I think it was, and he said it changed his life. And I wrote him back. I said, I'd like to hear more about it. Can you write me something and, and tell me how did it change your life? What aspects of it? Uh, what direction did your life then go into? Uh, I'd like to know more about it. Maybe talk about it on this podcast in the future. And I work with another guy, younger guy. He kind of lives out in the country. He was going through some issues and had heard about me through some of the Inception videos that I had done because I get them coming in from all, many different directions and then they get on the list and then I'll send out emails and things like that, which I haven't been real good about in the last year or so getting better. And so he called for a session and he actually wrote me before the session and asked me about it, what would happen with it. And he was a younger guy and he'd been out of work for a long period of time. And by the end of our emails back and forth, he says, you know, I'm going to go get a job so I can have a coaching session. And he went out and had got himself a job and worked at a job that wasn't the best job in the world, but it gave him a lot of extra time where he could learn and study and listen to things. And he saved up the money. And within, I think it was his first paycheck a week and a half, two weeks later, he had paid for a session and said, I'm ready to go, sent the intake form. And we went through the process and it was a great session, and I felt like a lot of change had occurred, and it was nice to work with somebody. He had a, he had a good understanding, and he was open. He had paid the money, so he had com commitment and investment in the process and went out and actually worked for it and basically paid his whole paycheck or most of his paycheck to, to do the session. So I knew he was invested in the shift and in the change. And we went through the session, and it was a longer session than normal. I enjoyed talking to him and finding out about him, who he was as a person, his life. Because I I like to work with process, and I also like to work with conscious and unconscious mind. I want the I want and the person to have an understanding. A lot of times you can do hypnosis or NLP, and people can get changed, and they say, "Who cares what the change is or how I got it? It's changed, and it's good. I'm off to go." And a lot of people like to work with that. To me, after reading a lot of Milton Erickson stuff, who I think was the world's greatest therapist. Um, hypnotherapist, but he was also a medical doctor, psychiatrist, and he was able to get change that was incredible. He would say that, you know, when he could figure out a way to get rapport between the person's conscious and unconscious mind, that a lot of the issues were because they were the unconscious and the conscious mind were kind of battling each other, not in rapport. And that if he could get that rapport between them on a certain subject or a certain issue or a certain problem, that the problem would resolve and he had discovered that after most of his years working and how to utilize the other aspect was how to use utilize what's going on right now in that person's life and what comes up and what that person says so when I'm working with people I like to give them a, a conscious metaphor something that they can hold on to so that when the behavior does change or something major happens and they notice it they aren't spooked back into their old behavior They've got something consciously to go, oh, okay, this is what's happened. A lot of it falls into the unconscious, and people just get back to a normal state, and they really don't pay attention to it. And other people say, hey, what happened to you? What's going on? What's, 
something seems different about you. I'm not sure when you cut your hair or whatever. And then that gives them clues that something has shifted and changed. But a lot of times people just default back into quotes, normal, uh, or they feel them normal selves because the issue isn't there anymore and they don't recognize it. And other people do. So I have them be aware that, you know, pay attention to what your, your, the people around you say, if you're not noticing a whole lot yourself, because it will feel like there's not an issue and it goes back to normal. However, when they do recognize it and they are aware of it, they also, people also want to know, you know, what has happened. And if you give them some conscious models that when they do observe that something in their behavior or attitude or feelings or emotions has changed, they've got something to grab onto. They've got meaning to it. And then it encourages them to, to do it again. So anyways, uh, this gentleman emailed me and said he thinks he's ready for a tune-up session. And I said, yep. I said, I remember us talking about that. And so he said, um, I think there's a lot, of, lot going on, and I just want to confirm and talk to you about some of this stuff and have you tell me where I'm at and what you think's going on. So he didn't have anything really specific. I think it was more about his discovering what was going on with himself. And so we had the session and the call, and, and his attitude and his understanding of what had happened and the amount of reading he'd done on spiritual things, on NLP and on hypnosis and change work in the meantime, and I think he's, he's 28, I'm not positive, but... It was tremendous. Uh, com- looked like a completely looked and sounded like a completely different person, and his attitude from not feeling really great about life in his position and where he was, even though he was still working the same job, his attitude about it, his attitude about his family, his attitude about other people, and other people noticed noticed to the f- to the point where he said, "His mother is like, what has happened to you? What's going on with you?" And he talked to her a little bit about it, and he thinks, and he said, I think, she said back to him, I think I want to do this. I think I want to explore this. If this can really happen, then there's some things I'd like to change in my life. So don't know if that's going to happen yet. I told him, yep, I'd be willing to work with her, and I'm open to it. And um, But when you have that kind of shift where he consciously can recognize, and then as we talked about it, he repeats back to me. Now, this happens pretty well with most people that I talk to, uh, not quite on this level. I'm giving you an example of somebody that really, really grabbed onto this and went with it and and got what was happening and felt it and noticed it and wanted to continue to talk about it to the point where he wants to begin to do this in business. And I started broadcasting and doing podcasts back in 2004 when podcasting was brand new and I was one of the first podcasters out there. And a lot of guys were interested in this. And I still get emails, like I, the one yesterday, saying, I, you know, thank you very much. I just wanted to let you know. I appreciate you doing podcasting again. And when a session I did with you back in 2006, it changed my life. I would hear this over and over again. And another big thing I heard was pe- these guys were getting into the business of NLP and hypnosis and change work. They so appreciated what had happened to them on the inside and the outside and the behavior differences that they decided to take it up and want to learn it themselves and go out and help other people, whether it was in business or in personal life, doing personal coaching, some people doing coaching uh, around, you know, that they take what they're already doing, which I recommend. What are you already doing? What are you already good at? We don't have to start from scratch again and bring this technology into that field. And uh, it's just wonderful to see these shifts and these changes that happen. And as I grow, as I learn, as I work with these people, I'm able to refine what I'm doing. I'm able to notice things more and more, which helps me to then get a more powerful result with the person. Because the tools that I help these people with, and basically everybody's got the resources to either learn to 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 uh, implement resources to learn resources or they have the resources already and they just need to connect it up and so the ability to it, it, you imagine <clears throat> excuse me imagine going down the street and we're riding together in a car and you take a route 
and you've taken this route over and over and over again, that it becomes automatic to you. You know how to get there. You could probably drive that route almost with your eyes closed, but you, you really wouldn't need much information. And a lot of times you probably take that route and you wonder, geez, I don't even remember driving home. I don't even remember this, this journey of how I got there. And imagine me getting in the car with you. And this route, let's say that you take, is not a route that's pleasurable. Let's say that this route is one that causes you stress. And the route I'm talking about is in your mind, something that you think about, something that continues to happen to you automatically, that uh, stresses you out, that causes you pain, that keeps you underperforming, that keeps you blocked from doing things that you want to do to move forward in your life. Uh, maybe some kind of a traumatic experience that happened to you in your past and you don't know how to process it. You don't even know what it is, but you know something's in there. And so what I say is, come on, let's ride this ride together and I'm going to see what I can notice. And as I go down the road with you and you're into automatic mode and I just have you start telling me about the drive, which then starts to make you aware of what's happening on the ride, something that you've has been unconscious. I'll ask some crazy questions. People say, you you really want me to do this or ask that question? One guy, I remember, we were sitting in an office, and it was actually I was doing some golf coaching, and I had him do something with his hands, and he looked around the room. I said, what are you looking at? He goes, I'm looking to see where the cameras are. He goes, you're having me do this goofy stuff, and I'm wondering if you got me filming, if this is a practical joke or something. And I said, no, no, not at all. I promise. I said, just trust me. Give me a few more minutes. Just trust me and just do this with me and and let me know what happens. And so he finally did what I was asking him to do with his hands and then had him put his hands down and he took a big breath and he's like, oh, wow. He goes, I I had no clue that was going to happen. I said, yeah, that's it because it becomes automatic with you. And when it's automatic, you're not noticing it. A lot of that's why I still go to therapy. That's still why I go to coaching and do the TCU calls. There's stuff I can't see. You know, people say to me, you know, me and other people, I've said this before. You know, you're a big guy. Why don't you lose the weight? Well, I have. I've lost a lot of weight. Fifty. I was down about seventy pounds. I've gained a few back because some of the medication that I'm on, but still down quite a bit. And a lot of times, I can't see it. If a heart surgeon could be the best heart surgeon in the world. Can that person, he or she, operate on their own heart? No, you need a a perspective. You need somebody outside that can look at things. That's not to say I can't work on a lot of things myself and and do and shift things. I mean, I enjoy that aspect of it too, but there's certain things I get stuck and I'll call up John, John Overdurf um, and other people that I work with and John Burton and say, hey, look, I'm stuck. I, I need some help here. Can you give me a hand? And usually because of my awareness in it, they can manipulate and move it around pretty quick. But we'll be going down the highway and they'll be looking straight down the highway and and, and I'm looking off to the side and and I see something in the woods and I say, stop. And they're like, what do you mean? I say, stop right now and just back up a little bit. Nope, go pull forward. And I see something between the trees and the woods and say, okay. And I'll say, tell me more about that. They're not aware of it. And what we do is we begin to flesh it out. And then it's almost like a telescope. We start to, or binoculars, we start to zoom in and get closer to what it is. And once you can clear that up or get that out of the way, now that hidden factor isn't there anymore. Okay. And you begin to clear more and more of those things up. And if we can go and we can find out which one is going to be the biggest block that has a domino effect that maybe can knock down a bunch of other issues along with it. That's what I like to do. That's what I feel I'm good at, that I can go in there and find that one thing. What's that one thing that can eliminate the whole file folder full of stuff instead of going at it one at a time where we can take one file and do something with that one file and knock all the other files out at the same time. So we don't have to go through those individually. So we're, we're actually going at a class of issue. So what is the big pattern that's going on that if you shift some things with the big pattern, then everything else that's been attached to that issue because of the pattern then also is eliminated because we've changed the process and we can learn the basics of NLP and hypnosis. And it, it takes a while like an artist, you, uh, you can go and you can learn things about color and lines and depth. Uh, but if you're painting 
it takes a while to get to the point where you begin to have your own art, where you can integrate those things. When you're playing guitar or piano, you learn the chords first. You practice that over and over and over again. You start with the fundamentals and the basics, which I go back to all the time, the fundamentals and the basics. And I learn about it recursively, which means that, you know, just like if you go and you read a book when you're a kid and then you read it as an adult, you've learned something new about it. The things in it mean something different to you. The words mean something. Things of that you had throughout life that now through life experience, you might better understand a character. You might have liked a character and then not like the character anymore because you've had some life experience. It happened to me with a television show that I watched, somebody that I liked years ago in the movies and found very attractive and personality and everything. And then I watched her in something a little bit more in depth. And it was a series, TV series over a period of time. And I realized how narcissistic she was. Now, maybe she's playing that in the role, but that narcissistic part, I go back and look and, and it changes what I thought about her earlier. And that can work both ways. It can be better or it can get worse. So a lot of times, let's say is a child or somebody that when you're younger, that you uh, feel a certain way or you're attracted to a certain person or you have a certain pattern because your parents had that and you seek that out because it's comfortable and familiar and you find it in other people. And you go, you know what, this, I don't like this anymore. Why, why am I still doing this? Why am I still being around these type of people? Um, it's because you're familiar with it because you know, the pattern, you know how to interact, you know, your part in the play and what you can do about it. And you know, something's up. That's why people usually seek coaching or therapy. You know, something's up, but you don't know exactly what it is. And that's the whole idea of why you come to see somebody like me is to say, okay, here's what's going on in my life. Um, and you may know directly or think you know directly what it is. And that's a great starting point. It may not end up being that. It may be something completely different as we start to flesh it out and get down deeper into the, the, um, the issue or what you think the issue is. And then there's people that come in that have a lot of implicit or hidden unconscious stuff where they know something's wrong, but they're not sure. And that's when we kind of do the journey where I'll say, okay, stop right here because I'll hear something. My ears are tuned to this. I do a lot of work on the phone. been doing some Skype lately so I can look at the other people and watch what they're doing with eye movements. In person to me is the best. But I got to say, working on the phone really is listening to differences in tonality, pitch and volume, all those things they talk about in NLP. And hearing that, that part that might be the issue when you go by it, makes a little noise, makes a little sound, makes a little difference in pitch or tonality, and I'm able to lock on and say, wait a minute, okay, let's go back, let's back this up, okay, go forward, and then we really zero in on it. One of the things I tell people when I'm doing sessions, I say, look, I'm going to interrupt you a lot, and the interruption is not to be rude, the interruption is because I hear something, and if we go too far down the track and then say, okay, let's go back to that, by that point, unconsciously, the information not be, may not be available to be able to go back to that point. It's real tough sometimes. But if it's there and it's fresh and it's popped up, because the unconscious knows that wants change. It just doesn't have the tools. And part of, uh, not part of, what I do is help you find the tools that make either the connections or give you the resources to get past the issue. But the unconscious usually will give all kinds of signals, and you got to listen for it. You get trained for it. That's what hypnosis has done for me really well, is taught me. People tell, start to tell me stories and say, I don't know why after you just said that, all of a sudden this thought came up. And I encourage them. I said, whatever comes up, come, I don't care if it sounds stupid, if it's a thought, if it's a picture, if it's a feeling, if it's a sound, you hear something. I hear, I'm hearing a train sound in, in my head, and I don't know why after you did that. And I'm like, great, that's perfect. That's, that's a, a great signal from the unconscious. The unconscious has given us another clue, and it's going to see if we're, we're doing this by chance or we actually know what we're doing. So let's go down that trail and what, what happens here and what happens there, and let's move it here and let's move it there. And then the unconscious, once it realizes that it's getting tools that are useful to you, what will happen is it will begin to give more and more information. Again, that's the report. And if we can get them, the person, you, the client, whoever it is, to un- unconsciously bring it up and then consciously say, here's what's going on, here's what's been happening process-wise, 
And the person, oh, then we find that resistance begins to stop, that the conscious and the unconscious work together as a team to bring you to the next level. And it doesn't have to be problems with trauma. It doesn't have to be problems with your past or worry or anxiety. It could be something in your business or you're, you're in sales or you're in customer service. It doesn't matter. Say, I want to be better at this. How can I open myself up to have more tools? What do I look for? What am I more aware of? Um, when I'm talking to different people, sometimes friends of mine, and they're in sales or they're talking to somebody in customer service and they're having a problem with a client, they'll go, I'm not sure what to say or to do. And I said, ask them this question. Next time they do that, ask them this question. And then what? And then here's, here's a couple possibilities that you could go with either way. They'll call me back and they'll say, God, it worked great. It just worked great. I couldn't believe it. It was So people are held back and think they have issues and problems, but it could be that they're also just wanting to get better. A golfer, I'm a good golfer, but... I, I don't know what I'm doing or how to get better. I've taken all kinds of golf lessons from pros, and there's something in there. It may just be a block. So it can be looked at as two ways, to take a problem and make it better or to say, I want to be even better at that. And one of the things Richard Bandler said years ago, he was the co-developer of NLP, he says you get enough good clients, and what will happen, what will begin to happen is, is that you clear things. He says, uh, you know, the older therapist, the, the more conventional therapist will look forward to you coming in and continuing therapy and doing session after session after session. Uh, if you want to see that, go watch a program called In Treatment on HBO, which I think is excellent because it's looking more at how people use content more so than process with a little bit of process and context in there. But um, I sit there and watch the show and say, well, he could have knocked that out right there if he'd have just followed that little path. But they're doing it in a different way. They're doing it in a whole different way. So if we begin to find out what these things are, most of the time it's just you don't have the resources to get past it. So we build resources. If the bridge is out, I, I use an analogy of kind of like, you know, imagine going and you're, you're driving around the city and you see all these, you know, you they have these in different cities. I don't know if they have them in Europe as much as America, but they'll use orange and white striped things. It could be cones. It could be barriers that kind of like let you know, detour, don't go here. You can't go here. And if you have a bunch of those detours, let's say you drive a certain way around a city and these streets have been blocked off. And so you have to go a really long way or go through all kinds of hoops to get where you want to go. But one day you stop and you look at one of those barriers and you look past the barrier and realize the road is just perfect. And if you take that road, it'll get you there a lot quicker and a lot faster, a lot smoother, a lot easier on you, your body. And then you go to the next one and you say, wow, that one's all right too. And there may be one or two out that need some repair. And so we can work on repairing or we can continue on the detour. But what if it just took for you because you had assumed as a child or somebody that was younger that this is the way things were, but when you revisited it and re-looked at it, if you know what that is to revisit and to relook, got out of your car, walked up and saw that that was there, and what if you just moved the barrier and then was able to drive past it and realized the barrier was only there because you thought it was still there? Because you hadn't looked on the other side to see that there was a road already there, that you already had a way to get there built in there. The only thing you needed to do was take away the belief that that wasn't there, that this was the way you had to do it. I have to do it this way. No, you don't. There's multiple ways that you can do things. So uh, I'll give you a little example, which I thought was was uh, kind of funny. I've been doing some spring cleaning and selling a lot of stuff on Craigslist and eBay and uh, eBay's a little bit different. eBay, you're getting a little bit more professional. You don't have too many people playing games with you. They've pretty well um, programmed that out of there. They've, they've refined it to the point where you got somebody that's interested, that's making a bid. But on Craigslist, one of the things with Craigslist, for those of you unfamiliar in, in Europe or maybe Australia or different countries around the world, it's a free service that you can use to sell in your town or county. And there's all kinds of different sections. You can sell antiques. You can sell, you know, 
farm and garden equipment. You can sell furniture. You can sell electronics. Whatever it is you want, they give you many different places to to um, put put your uh, items that you want to sell. And you put pictures in there, and you put a price, and you describe the item a little bit, and then the person contacts you back. Well, there's a lot of scammers. There's a lot of spammers that are trying to get your email so they can spam you. And a lot of people will write these things to you that are like, I'm really interested in it, but I get off of work and maybe we could meet at the Walmart around the corner. Well, the closest Walmart to me is 35 miles. I live in the stinks. I live in the middle of nowhere. And the other thing is, is people say, okay, I'm coming right over and I'm really interested and I'll bring the money and I'm going to buy it. And you don't hear from them again, or maybe you hear from them a week or two later, or people are coming over and saying, okay, I'll take this. Don't let anybody else look at it. And they'll come over and they'll look and they're like, nah, I'm not, not really interested. It's like, well, you had 10 pictures to look at. You drove all that way. What is it that you're looking for? I don't know. I'm just not in. So there's a lot of people like that there. And so I start my own little filtering systems to realize the first thing I ask is if you ever get one of those things saying, Hey, let's meet at the closest Walmart. And it's usually a Gmail address, or I'm really interested in your, they don't give you any specifics. They just give you generalities of what it is. And you're going like, well, if you if you got 20, 10 or 20 products, they're going, well, what the heck product are they, you know, what are they interested in? What part of the product are they interested? In? How much they, and they just want you to send your email to them and they maybe try to rope you into a different scam or say, hey, give me your bank account, I'll transfer the money, I'm going to have somebody else pick it up. And then you get into a Nigerian thing. So the first thing I'll, I'll write back to them is say, where are you located? And usually I don't hear back from them after that because the research it would take to find out the ad and the towns that are around and what, I don't know, I'll say, you know, I'm, I'm close to, um, you know, this exit in, in Mount Shasta or I'm, I'm off the, do you know where that is? I won't hear anything back from them. But if they are local and they're interested, usually they'll go, yeah, I know right back. Or no, I'm in Weed, California, which is about six miles. Believe it or not, there's a town called Weed. They do all kinds of play on weed. You know, I love Weed, California, and things like that. Um, so that that's their big, it's kind of an old mill town, a um, uh, logging mill town. And uh, then there's Wairica, which is about 35 miles away, but... The county is one of the biggest counties in California, and the total population is about 44,000, I think. And the biggest city in the county is Wairica, which is 11,000, I think. We're 3,000 3, people and probably almost almost 3,000 in weed. So you don't get much action on Craigslist. Nothing like when I was in Texas, when I was in Austin, Dripping Springs area, when I'd put something in, I'd get hits all the right away, and I'd basically would say, first come, first serve. I said, that's the way people beg me, please save it, please do it. And I'd, I'd say, okay, I'll save it for it. Then you wouldn't hear from them again. You'd sit there and make time and wait for them. So I got to the point I would just start telling people, look, you know, this is Craigslist, first come, first serve. Um, I had a lady today that was supposed to be here at uh, 2 o'clock. She goes, yeah, I know. She goes, I sell houses on Craigslist, blah, blah, blah. Um, I know exactly what it's like. And she gives me this thing, 60% of the time they don't show up or say anything. She goes, I get off work at two. And I said, okay, well, I said, you, you let me know, give me an email when you get off of work. And, um, I will then send you. So I've already gone um, one or two emails with this person, but I still haven't given her my phone number or address. And I say to her, I said, two o'clock, you call me or not, not call me, but you email me and tell me that you're, um, you're ready to come down and where you're coming from. And I will give you my phone number and my address. Well, I'm thinking, let's see, let me look at the clock right here. It is three twenty. have not heard back from her. That's not saying I won't hear back from her. I may just hear back from her, but I'm just clicking over to my emails right now. Nothing from her. So that's the way it is. Now I used to get upset a lot about this with different people. And sometimes I still do. It's like, oh, what a waste of time that was. Uh, the lesser priced items, I have a tendency to blow it off more. Um, but the more expensive priced items, I, I just, I don't like people playing games with me. So, so I said, okay, it's time to implement a little bit more NLP and hypnosis, a little bit more persuasion and, into this and really start to flesh these people out because of these games. And I hit, so I'm going to read you through a conversation of, I don't know, there's 10 or 15 emails with this one guy. And this guy's a professional. 
and he's a, a church goer, professional neighbor. And, um, this is the kind of the, the email that I go through, but I'm also telling you this and showing you this because I'm going to bring in a little bit of sales skills in there too, a little bit of NLP. And we're going to talk, uh, we're going to work on shifting his values a little bit, which is really important in the, in the, in the concept of, of doing coaching or going to a seminar that you want to go to and you're spending money. A lot of this is about getting your value shifted. And a lot of times people will sell you on stuff and shift your values, but they're not good at producing. You know, you go and you pay. I know people that have paid $5,000 to get in a coaching and they get through a, a program of coaching and they find out that, you know, some kid that just came out of college in Utah that did, you know, um, has been taught by an internet guru a couple processes to ask people questions, but has no real life experience. And, you know, they end up paying, it's, by the time they get done, they're paying, you know, two, three, four, five hundred dollars a session for somebody that doesn't have any idea what they're doing. But in, in contrast, you know, if you can pay the five, and you get through, the, through to the place where well, I've worked with some of these people, that's why I'm bringing it up, people that have paid this big money and gone through multiple coaching sessions. And say, okay, now you're going to find out, you know, what you got a real coach. Let's do it. Let's get on this thing and, and let's get it knocked out. And they're blown away. And sometimes they'll get upset because they've, they've spent this money. We had one lady who had just come off of one of those $5,000 coaching sessions. And she was really, really upset and angry with this person. I said, just settle down. I said, and she was afraid to spend any more money because she had been duped. So she had had her value systems tweaked and the belief systems tweaked about what she was going to get as a result of this coaching sessions that she had spent over a period of weeks or or months and then comes out of it and said she felt worse and was more disappointed and now 5,000 she had put on her credit card. I did a session with her and next thing you know, she's in business doing well and she just had some procrastination issues that we worked on, got her passed and she's doing fantastic. And now would that cost her cost $250 compared to the $500 that or $5,000 that she had spent on this other thing and, and was in a worse off position. Um, because the script doesn't work on everybody. You know, one of the things we knew in hypnosis was that there's about 20% of the people that were what they call somnibalistic, which means that you can get a kid to read a hypnosis script, a good hypnosis script, and that person will go under. So just about anybody that will just sit there and read a script to them, they're so hypn- they can be induced by hypnosis so quickly, and they're so susceptible to it that just reading that. And so a lot of people, a lot of hypnotherapists, a lot of people out there will just rely on getting that one in five. And Erickson wasn't about that. Erickson wasn't about that. He was he was about using hypnosis in a different way than classical hypnosis that got the one in five. And sometimes they'd get more than one in five, obviously, you know, minimum of one in five, you know, you're going to get one in five. That'll just do it. Um, because, because they're so susceptible to hypnosis, but he used more of a permissive hypnosis where he would get in and realize that everybody could get to this state, but they had resistance. They needed permission. They needed um, something in a value shift that allowed them where they willingly said, yes, I want to do this. Yes, I want to do this. They didn't get into their deep unconscious using hypnosis and create imaginary scenarios where the person would do it. They actually would get to the point where the person could see the value of the shift and the change and go to the next step. And then you progressively take that person through that again. So they're consciously aware they just don't begin to do the behavior. A lot of times when people do the behavior, they're back into a trance. And, and I watched uh, a hypnotist work with Howie Bandel, the comedian on American Idol, on one of those shows with Howard Stern and some uh, ex-model, supermodel that's on there. I don't even know what her name was. But Howie Mandel was on there, the professional comedian. But he's had a germ phobia for years. And this guy hypnotized him very quickly and then said, okay, I've got a rubber in his imagination. I've got a rubber surgical glove on my hand. And he reached out to shake his hand and he goes, everybody else you're going to shake hands with has a rubber, rubber surgical glove on his hand. And so how he starts shaking hands and the audience is going nuts <clears throat> and Howard Stern and the other person is going nuts. And everybody says, wow, look at that hypnosis works and what it was. Uh, now uh, there was a part of him acting that was in his imagination, but he wasn't really conscious of it. 
And then I watched a show the next day where Holly, how, how he was on. I think it was like a good morning America type thing. Uh, one of those morning shows, <clears throat> excuse me. Matter of fact, I'm going to get a quick sip of Mount Shasta headwaters from the headwaters of the Sacramento, the sacred river in Mount Shasta, California. If you ever get a chance to come up here and taste the water up here, it's the best you'll ever have, probably. Uh, we dip it in the headwaters, or I'll just go to the city water. A lot of people have been standing and bathing in the headwaters lately, and that's not very appealing to me to get my drinking water from there. So I will pull it out of, uh, it's a little bit further up the mountain that it comes down in, into the city, and it's just... So cold and so pure and, and so great tasting. So anyways, back to Howie Mandel. So Howie um, gets on the show and they're talking to him. And, and a lot of times people remember what happened in hypnosis, but certain parts of it they do forget. They have amnesia for. And he goes, yeah, he goes, I've watched the show and everything. And he goes, I, I still have the phobia and everything like that. And he goes, yep. And he goes, he got me to do all that other stuff. He goes, but I still have my issue. So there are workarounds through hypnosis, but if you're in a trance and you forget things and you're just doing things um, through hypnosis, but the issue still is there, really you're, you're just blanking out, blanking out part of your life. So that's one of the reasons I like to stay more with a conversational hypnosis and NLP and keep it going back and forth and keep the person aware because, again, between the conscious and the unconscious mind. So I figure with the people on Craigslist, it's kind of a place to play a little bit. And I said, you know what? Instead of doing the straightforward thing, I'm going to have a little bit of fun. I'm going to do some experimenting and play with some of the NLP, some of the stale stuff I know, some of the you know influence stuff that I know. Um, <clears throat> with some of these people that I, th- I wonder if they're, they're playing games with me, but they got to kind of do something that says, okay, time to have a little fun. So I have a car seat for sale, one of Claire's car seat, my daughter, who's now too big for it. And when we were, we originally had a car seat that we, we had two of them. Uh, but the first one we got was, um, an old one she had had from, from Max. And then when we were traveling, actually coming out to Mount Shasta from Texas, when I first brought Kathy out here, we rented a car and we forgot the car seat to bring the car seat. So, or the car seat didn't show up. I can't remember what it was with the airlines. So we went to immediately, you know, we had her in the car, we were driving her in the back seat and, um, went immediately to a Walmart and this was in Reno, Nevada, Reno, Nevada, Walmart. You ever go there? You're going to, you think you're in Reno 911. It really, it was really like, wow, let's get out of here. You know? So I had her stay in the ki- in the car with the kids, locked the door, and ran in real quick and picked up a car seat for a hundred bucks and brought it out, and that worked well, and it was comfortable and everything. But then Kathy, which I was unfamiliar with, Kathy started telling me a little bit about car seats and the difference in them and the quality difference in them and everything. So I'm like, okay, this is the best one they had in in the Walmart that I bought. And she goes, oh no, there's much better ones than that. And one of the companies is called Britax, B R I T A X. And so I got onto Amazon. I started reading the reviews and the quality differences and everything. I'm like, no, we, we need to get her the best right away. I mean, this this is it. I mean, you think about an $100 or $150 difference between the two car seats because this one was eh, 230 or 250 something like that. And it was on sale from its list price, but I ordered it right away. Boom, hit the button, had it delivered to the house. And Claire liked the, the comfort of the seat much more until she started growing out of it. It started becoming uncomfortable when she became a little bit big for it. Or she thought she was a little bit big for it. Uh, that, you know, young girl wanting to be a teenage girl syndrome as well. Car seat deal. Anyways, so we had sold the, the first one uh, a year or so ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And since she wasn't, I said, Kathy, is she going to use this or the other booster seat that we have? Nope, she's not going to use it anymore. The little booster seat we have now, because of her age <clears throat> and her height, no problem in California. Legally, she can she can do it that way, and she's not going to get back in the seat. So I took it out, took it apart, power washed it, had a power washer, cleaned it up, got it looking really good and everything, and then put it in the newspaper or, or Craigslist newspaper. Yeah, we used to do the classified ads years ago, but put it in Craigslist, 
And, you know, pretty quick, got some hits on it. But again, we're in the middle of nowhere. We're in a small place and people aren't going to drive up from Reading, which is, you know, about 70 miles away to pick up a car seat and save a few bucks on it. They'll find one down in Reading. And so I, I don't have a lot of comparison. I did some searching and see what people were paying for these car seats. It's a Britax Frontier 85 for those interested. Anyways, I figured, okay, we paid, you know, two thirty, two fifty four. Let me put it in for a hundred bucks. Immediately got a hit, and from several people. But this guy says, "How old is the Britax seat, and what is the expiration date?" Expiration date on a car seat. I'm like. <laughs> I have no idea. I told him we had bought it three years ago exactly because it was pretty well to the day that he, you know, we put in the paper and we only used it for two of those years. She used it for two and then for the last year she hasn't been using it. Um, and I put, I never heard about the expiration date. I said, is this a serious inquiry? Because a lot of times people ask really crazy, stupid ass questions on, on the Craigslist. And he writes back and he says, Yes, this is a serious inquiry. I thought most car seats have an expiration date on them for some reason. Has it, he wrote have, have it been, but it's has it been in a car that was in any type of fender bender, even a small one? And I'm like, no. I wrote him back, no. And then didn't hear anything from him. And then five days later, it's 26, 20, wait a minute, 27, 7. Yeah, it was in there 10 days. It's about 10 days later, maybe a little longer. And he writes me and he says, would you take $50 if I get it today? Now, I'd re- reposted it and dropped the price from 100 to 75 because I'll let it sit there for a while and see if anybody's going to go for it. And that'll kind of let me know if the price is accurate or not. So um, nobody was hitting on it at, at 100 And so I said, okay, I'll drop it down to 75 And he writes me back, you know, 10 days, two weeks later and says, you know, ask, ask me if the car seat has been in any kind of fender bender, even a tiny one has even been, the car's even been bumped. And I write him no. And then he says, uh, would you take $50? He goes, I'll get it today for $50. So I wrote him back and I said, well, I just dropped it from a hundred to 75, but if you want it, I'll go for 65. I'm like, all right, I'll give the guy another $10 break. If not, I'll wait as it is the top of the line protection car seat and I'm sure it will sell so he wrote back and this is this is the same day he now he's fast and furious on it we're getting into his his price range what he feels the value is in the price range of it and like I said this thing's still in pretty perfect condition it had a few stains on it from spills with Claire and everything like that but completely power washed it we redid it cleaned it up uh, put all the belts in the proper it really looked good so we probably put more time and effort in cleaning that up from our time value based on what we make per hour than, than the car seat was worth. Anyways, uh, he says, how about 60 cash? I could load the kids up right now and come get it. And whereabouts are you? So now's the question, whereabouts are you? And I, I don't know where he is yet, but I'm not. Until he tells me where he is, I'm not telling him where I'm at. Don't, that's one of the things, if you're, if you're selling on Craigslist, don't be in a hurry to give him your phone number and don't be in a hurry to give him your address. Because they will take advantage of that. You will have people. There's a lot of people that have been robbed by Craigslist people. Okay, that's the other thing, is that they will get your address and they'll come over and they know you've got something, especially if you got something expensive for sale. Uh, they may wait for you to sell the thing and see the ad drop and then go over and and, and, and rob or wait till you're gone out of your house. But now they have an address of something that they know that somebody is. Uh, Selling different things. Anyways, there's a system they've got. I have, I don't know what it is and haven't figured it out, but I do know that do not give your address or phone number until they absolutely have shown you enough evidence that they are coming to your house. Or a lot of times, if it's a smaller item, I'll meet them somewhere. We've got a place called Graffiti Bridge um, that's outside of town a little bit. And a lot of people meet to buy and sell stuff there, and it's it's a pretty well-traveled c- conjunction of two roads. You just go there and you bring something there and they meet you there and uh, you got it and they don't have to know where you live. Or maybe they know your phone number, but they don't have to know where you live. So he says, how about 60 cash? And I could load the kids up right now. Come and get it. Where, whereabouts are you? So I, I said back to him, my, my price that I dropped from 75, I said, so I go back to him and I said, how about 65? 
And then he writes back, LOL, how about $60.95? And I'm like, okay, so this guy's going to quibble. I've, I've come down from 100 to 75 and now I'm going to go down to 65 because he says he's going to come over and buy it right now, which he turns out really he was a neighbor. And it didn't take him but a few minutes to load his kids up and be in, at the front of my house before I even got my shoes on. But uh, he goes... LOLs, how about 60, 60 95 So now I'm going like, okay, I don't want to keep doing this over $60. And there's other people writing me asking about the car seat. And so I say, how can I give him what he wants but also get what I want? So think about that question. How can I give him what he wants but also get what I want? I don't want to sell it to him and drop another $5. I could. I don't need the $5 as bad as he does. He's got girls. He's got uh, five kids and three of them are girls and he needs car seats. He's got a lot already. So um, I said to him, here's what I'll do. If it doesn't sell by this week, I will give it to you for $60, okay? So I'm telling him I'm going to give him what he wants. But what I want to do is I want now a few more days to sell it at 75. He's already come up with the value that this thing at 75 is worth it. He's writing me. Now he's trying to get me down a little bit more on the price. He's in the range. It's hit his value. He knows this car seat is 250 the, the new ones to get an equivalent. He's going to pay 250 bucks, 300 bucks to get something that's equivalent to it. So this has now become a deal. Uh, if it's fishing, he's biting. And so he wants to get it. He's going to argue over the $5. And I'm like, okay, dude, I'll give it to you. But give me a few more days to see if somebody's willing to pay me the six or the 75 where I don't even have to come down. And then, then I earn myself an additional $15 for something because I've got the time. I'm in no hurry to sell it. It's just sitting in the garage. And then I said this, and this is kind of where I start to say, okay, we're talking about $5. And when you're in negotiations, $5 is a ma- can be a matter of competition. And he's in there. He hits me with $60.95. He's in competition mode. I've got to get him into a different mode. I've got to get him back into value. And what the car seat is about. The car seat is about what? the safety of his kids, knowing he's going to get top-notch safety for his children that are riding in his vehicle. Not just to have a protection and to have car seat to meet the laws, but he wants a Britax or Britax, whatever, however you say it. And, and so now he, it's, it's into the value system. But we're into a mode, a framework of $60.95. We're in, we're in competition. We're in negotiations. So now I have to take it to a different level. And say, okay, look, I'm being fair with the guy. 100 down to 75. Going to give him 65, 10, more, 10 less than, and it's the first day I'm putting it. I mean, I just put it up there. It didn't take him long to hit on it. And so it's like, I got time. You know, I don't, I'll play with it for 10 more days. And, and so, but he knows in 10 days somebody else is going to get it. And I know that he knows that. So I wrote this little line here. And I said, I wouldn't let $5 get in the way of you getting one of the best and safest car child seats made. Um, Let me read it. Let me get my screen. I'm kind of a little far away from that screen. Let me read that again. I wouldn't let $5 get in the way of you getting one of the best and safest child car seats made for some cheaper version. And then the kicker line was, think of who is in it. Think of who's in the car seat. So now he's going back. Why is he really buying the car seat? It's not about $5. It's about his daughter being in the safest car seat on the market or one of the safest car seats on the market. So, I mean, it wasn't but just a few seconds before I got the next email from him and he says, well, when you put it that way, are you around today? There, there's now there's nothing, nothing more. And I say to him, yeah, I'm around. And I kind of told him a little bit about it. And I said, you know, the same thing had happened to me when, when I didn't know anything about car seats. But then when we talked about getting another car seat that was better from a hundred dollars to 250, and the features of it, I was kind of going like, yeah, it's $150 more. And then 
it's like who's in the car seat sold i'll pay easily pay the 250 and so i I told him i said same thing happened to me and i'm just putting it back with you so a lot of times and why do why do we bring this up because a lot of times people pay five thousand dollars to come into a, a coaching session um I used to do it with Joe. I mean, people would pay five grand and he was basically at one point splitting it with me. And then he determined there was more and more expenses that came up until the point where he got down and said, you know, uh, he got paid, but there, by the time expenses were done and everything, there's no money left over. So it used to be a 50, 50 equation. It got down to the point where the, the last one, uh, let, one before last, I was only getting a small percentage. And then the last one, he goes, you know, we didn't make any money today. I can't pay you for that. And I worked my ass off for three hours. I, did, I told him uh, how to develop the Rolls-Royce Rolls mastermind. He was hemming and on about what can I do to make money? How can we? And I told him, I said, if you want to buy the Rolls-Royce, let's start doing masterminds with it. Let's start doing coaching sessions in there. We'll take him out the dent. But he's going, good, great. Let's buy it and do it. So, and he made good money and he paid for his payments every month on that. And people were paying five grand to come in there. I, I thought that was quite high, but he says, look, they're getting a chance to sit with me and be around with me. And we're taking them to dinner and they get to ride in the Rolls-Royce and they get to do coaching with you. But I would work my ass off during that. He goes, you're working way too hard and we're supposed to only keep them for three hours and you're keeping them for five. I said, Joe, these people are telling me in private, they've put all this on a credit card and this is the last of their money. I want to give them something that's of value to them and, and work with them. So I've, I've made quite a bit of money on coaching. And uh, at first, I was afraid uh, that it was a spiritual gift, and I was afraid to charge anything for it. And it took John Overder for a while to get me to finally begin to start charging for it. And then when I started charging for it, I started going, okay, wait a minute. I'm, I could then begin to see the value. I couldn't if For free, I could not see the value. Uh, but when I started getting paid for it, I realized I wasn't getting paid enough for what I was doing. And it kind of, you'll find if you, so I'm, I'm, I'm giving those people a lesson that want to get into a different business or want to charge more or whatever. You'll start to find a certain level of the people that you're working with. And, you know, I went up to, you know, kept going up progressively to 150 an hour. And then it went up to 250 an hour because I was getting so busy at 150 an hour. I was like, okay, if that many people are coming in at 150, and, and I say an hour, really, if you think about it, if I'm doing a two hour session, it's 75 bucks an hour. And, uh, anyways, um, that I went up to 250 to slow it down, to slow it down. And I was willing to keep going up to 500 or 1,000 or whatever it is. And now I'm starting to get in people that want me to start coming into corporate work and start working in corporations. And if I do that, then I'm probably not going to be doing much personal coaching at all. And so I encourage you, if you want to do some of that coaching, do it now. But you think about the idea, people think 250 per hour. They're in a mindset, they're in a mind frame of what that is per hour compared to how much they make per hour. But if you can say, look, at 28 years old, like this, this gentleman I've been working with, and the shifts and the changes that's going on with him for the money that he's paid me over two sessions, and you bring him to the end of his life and say, would you have rather... Well, was that a good investment for you? Was that a lot of money for you? He, he, he tells me right in the, in the phone, he goes, no, that, that's cheap compared to what I'm getting right now. And that's what I want to hear from people. By the end of it, they realize that what they paid was a pittance for what they got. But it's on two different types of value systems. You look and you say, I mean, I'm doing stuff, some th stuff on Thumbtack to play a little bit with this wording and terminology. It gives me kind of a free place to, uh, to play. People are constantly wanting a therapist for this or wanting a therapist for that. And, it, and it's kind of more commercial and you're dealing with people that you realize don't have a lot of money and I keep my 250 on there. I don't care. It's the idea of when they write me back, it's the interplay with words and to get them to realize the value, whether it's me or somebody else, that if they get somebody that's proficient at what they're doing and knows what they're doing, 250 is nothing. It's nothing. I've spent probably at this point, getting close to a couple hundred thousand over the 25, 30 years or, or more on learning tapes, books, going to seminars, cost of travel, everything that's going, that's involved in that. And I'm going to continue to pay more because of, of the shifts and the changes. I know who I was. I know what's different now. I know what people say and people that are around me. I know how I can look at my daughter 
that if, if I hadn't gone through this, what the patterns from my past and, and, and childhood and everything like that, that, that there wouldn't be the kind of engagement that's there. What value do I put on that? The interaction with my daughter, the interaction with my, I've been doing a lot for some reason that goes in spurts. Uh, for at one point I had a lot of, uh, lesbians that were in, 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 in relationship problems. And I, I don't know why. And then I'll have people with post-traumatic stress and I'll have just a whole, they come in like these batches. And recently it's been relationship stuff, a lot of relationship stuff. And it, it's, it doesn't matter what it is. It's more about what's going to happen during the process. And you look back and you say, okay, if I compare it per hour, that's a lot of money compared to what most people make especially people that are wanting to raise the minimum wage to 750 or whatever uh, from 750 up to $15 an hour Seattle and different places like that but then you look at how much the the biggest bankers and uh, they say now it's the bankers aren't the biggest paid the FIFA people are the world cup people are and if you look at the corruption that's involved there it's incredible and how much they're making per hour they're making 10 grand an hour and it's, it's are they worth that you know 10 grand an hour, but if you can change my life so I have a better relationship with my daughter or my wife, and I'm talking to you or your husband, or you can do better at work, if I can help you do something that takes your career and you're making twenty five, thirty, forty thousand dollars a year in a little shift and you're making two hundred thousand dollars a year, how much is it worth now? I'll tell you a little about a, a guy I worked with. It's been about a year since I worked with him, but I worked with him probably five, six sessions. In the first call, he had told me he's a professional, run a professional, a business of professionals. And um, he, um, he told me, he goes, yes, the first time I work with you, he goes, um, I basically got a lot of your DVDs and, and, and tapes. And he says, I started practicing some of the things. And he goes, using your techniques, he says, I, I made $2 million. And I'm like, why didn't you write me and tell me about that? That would have been really nice to, to know that. He goes, no. He goes, I know it's directly associated with you. And what, what I did, he goes, it just it was miraculous the way that the things happened. And I said, that's great. And I said, how's your business going now? He goes, well, i am kind of got some issues that are coming in there. And he, thinks, he says, I think it's my patterns that are causing it. To, I know it's my patterns that are causing it to happen. And he goes, I need another $2 million. But this time, he goes, I, I got money and the business is running. He says, but... I'm in the process of getting a loan to expand the business. I've got a great opportunity to expand it, but because of some of the issues with some of the the professionals he had hired that were in lawsuits, he goes, there's no way I'm going to get this this loan. And I said, well, why are you calling me then? He goes, because I want to do this again. I know we can do this. And I said, I can't promise you get the million dollars, I said, or $2 million. I said, but let's do what we can with it. And so we worked over about three or four sessions as he was going through this progress of a loan of like, he's not going to get it, he's not going to get it. And to shift and change, not only how he talked to the bankers, how he dealt with the, the professionals that, that were in his business, but also how he thought about this because he didn't think he was going to get it. And, and he goes, this is why I hired you because I didn't think I would make it in the first thing. He said, but the way you shifted my thoughts to the DVDs, he says, now he goes, I want to make this money again. I said, okay, let's do it. And so by the last session, he called me back and he goes, Mar, and he's, he's, he's not originally from this country, but he, and I could tell, I could just feel the energy coming off of me. He goes, I got the loan, the impossible loan. I got the two, I got the check in my hand right now. So I was like, that's fantastic. I said, well, <laughs> I said, what percentage are you going to send this way? You know, I started thinking maybe I ought to start working for percentages when it comes to business because I've, I've had this happen a lot where people weren't making very much money and all of a sudden they started making a tremendous amount of money and said, okay, how, how, here's what I'll do. I'll work with you based on a percentage, based on a tithe, whatever it is. I, I actually had one guy that was tithing to me for a while that was pretty interesting. Um, he was from Europe. And he said he was this, you know, spiritually and and what he was making. And he wanted to share with me a percentage because it had grown so dramatically Mm -hmm. since he started applying some of the techniques. So then I say to this guy um, that's now we're (laughs) basically, he says, uh, and who knows? Who knows? I'm going to take him in his work. I know through the loan thing that through the, the sales aspect of how to talk to them, what to do in his office. I'm, man, I'm working, I'm giving him advice on managing his office, who to fire, who to hire, what to say, um, how to talk to some of the professionals that were working underneath him that were acting like little kids and how to, 
deal with them that he was able to get that stuff in line to get the loan. So then I say, who, who am I to say that the, the first time where he says, no, I, I know that this is what, and he goes, that was $2 million that I made from my bill. He said, it was directly responsible for the meditations that I was doing. So then I say to him, I said, so do you feel like it was worth the money? He goes, it, it's worth many times more. And I said, well, if you feel like it, you could send me a little bit. Of it. He, he laughed. And, and it's okay. I don't expect it. If he wants to send it to me and somebody wants it, that, that's fine. But from the perspective of you getting what you want, is it worth the money? What is your life worth? What are your relationships worth? Who's sitting in that car seat that's important to you? Is the amount of money that you make in your job, is, is the, that the job that you want? If you could get the dream job, if you could go into business, um, if you could stop procrastinating, what in the end is that going to be worth for you? Not just then. So get out of the mindset of the argument over $5 over a car seat of how much you're going to pay. And if it's not me, go to somebody like you know John Overdurf or John Burton or go to you know John Asseroff or whatever. Pay the big dollars. Pay what? Because if they can do it, and you can get there, it's not what you have. It's not a percentage of what you have now. If you turn around and look back from the future back and say, what percentage of what I have now after doing that and making that shift and that change, and is that worth it? How much would I pay for that? How much more would I pay for that? And it may be priceless, and you can't put a price on it. But if it's financially, you can you can definitely put a percentage on that and say that's that was a, a tiny investment. That was like investing in an apple when it was still small. I recently read a story. It was about a guy that he sold out his stocks in Apple early for like eight hundred dollars, and he would be worth I don't know how many billion dollars <laughs> if he'd have kept it and not sold out for eight hundred dollars. So to him at that point, he didn't see the future of Apple. He saw the 800 bucks and said, you know, that's more important to me now than what the future is. But if he had the billions now and looked back at the 800 bucks, I bet you he'd be wiping his, the sweat off his forehead and his brow and say, thank God I didn't do that, that I'd made this investment. And what you're doing is you're making an investment in yourself. There's things out there that you don't know about. If you went back, like a lot of times with Claire, my daughter, the one I'm working with her, and I'll talk to her, and she says, she'll, well, I can't do that, and I can't do that. And, and I say, well, let me teach you. I don't want to learn and everything like that. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, that girl that is your friend, and she's a couple years younger than you, does she know how to do that? No. Why not? Because she hasn't practiced it and learned it. One of the things we have is I constantly say to her, practice, practice, practice. Whenever she does something good, I said, why did you do good? And we'll go, practice, practice, practice. But I give her the perspective of looking back and saying, you know, that was you a few years ago. You couldn't do it either, but now you can. Now you can. And to, to see the difference of, of what that makes and to also to help other people see the difference of the progress that you can make, the progress that others have made, and say over a period of time, as she becomes more and more aware, as other people become more and more aware, when you get stuck, you don't grow. You stay like at that two-year-old. You don't have the, the deal to say, okay, now you're six years old, and what's the difference between the six and the two-year-old or the six and the four-year-old? You don't have that perspective because you're stuck. And these parts can grow really fast. You can get a part that's stuck at five years old that has an issue that it never resolved that's sitting in the unconscious mind, and you go, I don't know why, but I feel like a little kid when I'm like, yeah. Well, you still have a little kid in you from five years old that never grew up and you're still using the same patterns that worked from when you were five, seven, 15, 19, whatever, 30, 50 that are still there and they're stuck at a certain point. A lot of times like dominoes, when we can grow that part up, when we can give it a new pattern, a more useful pattern to use, then the dominoes fall in so many other areas of your life. And what happens is, is you, you just take it and imagine yourself only being able to view life from a six-year-old perspective. How much of life, if you're 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever, would you be missing? And what is that worth to get that back? What's it worth to get it back? What I've learned, what I've been trained at, what I've done myself is to learn how to give that experience to other people. That's why it's so fulfilling. When they grow up, that part grows up, that part gets the resources, what it needs 
it's amazing to watch what happens with these people and the transition. I, I, I feel from that. I mean, it inspires me. And sometimes I got to bite my lip because I'm so moved that somebody's been stuck with a trauma, a sexual trauma or a trauma from being in war. Um, and that is impeding them from sharing because they're constantly stuck in the sympathetic nervous system of fight or flight. They can't enjoy their lives. And then you can clear it and you watch them grow and you watch them start to expand. And then now they have more available to catch more of life. You know, if you're catching butterflies and you got a little fish net, you're not going to catch many butterflies. But if you get a big fish net, you could probably catch a lot of butterflies. And what this is about to me, the experience, what it's turned into, it started off back in 86 with NLP and hypno, well, hypnosis I've been doing since I was 13 years old. But it started off as that and, and an experience of something that was small, what the possibilities were. It was a, it was a fish net to catch a fish out of an aquarium. And then you start to have a bigger fish net to catch the the tuna and things like that, or a bigger net to catch butterflies. And the bigger your net is, the more you're going to catch of life. And that's what I'm saying. A lot of times we are out there with small nets trying to catch big things. You know, I want this car. I want this house. I want this life. I want this relationship. You want all those things. And it's not that they're not available to you. It's just you don't have a big enough net to catch it. And a lot of times you realize that these opportunities have been right there in front of you. And I study a lot of rich people. And I study, you know, for a long time I was on there, what is it about wealth? You know, what what makes these people? And it, it was a certain type of a mindset. And you talk to these people and you say, you know, they missed a lot of opportunity. But when they finally something, an aha experience happened where a part grew up or a part, the net got bigger. They realized the opportunity was there the whole time. The opportunity was there right in front of them the whole time. They just didn't have the ability to see it. And so you can't judge what that's going to be worth until you get there. And so if you have a sense that something's missing in your life, something's not there, you want to grow something, you want to get bigger at something, you want to have better relationships, you want to open up your spirituality, you want to be able to not have things be on your mind so much so when you're walking in the woods you can really experience and enjoy the trees and the beauty and the sunshine and the blue sky. If you're at the beach and you're thinking about your work back home, your net's pretty small. What do you got to do to change that net so it can catch your present experience as fully as possible? And to me that's what it's all about and that's why I'm so passionate about this is that when people get it and they start to expand and they, they go inductive and their nets become bigger and they can get more of life and their focus in it isn't directed because of internal issues and forced to look at a certain way. You know, I mean, just think about that, being on one of the best beaches in the world with your family and maybe friends and watching the beautiful sunsets and you're thinking about what's going on with the, the accountant that might have done something wrong before you left. Where's your, where's it aimed? You got a small net that's aimed into an imaginary place, but in front of you is just this massive opportunity. What do you do? You find somebody that shows you how to turn and turn around, where to focus your telescope and then open it up wide and take it all in. You get it. You take a deep breath and just go, no, this is what I've been looking for. Forget, forget about this. You just didn't know how to do it. You were doing the best you could with what you had. You're doing the best you could with what you have, but what if you could have something different in the direction of what you want that opens it up and gives you that much more? Think about it and then go back and think about that $5 difference between the pricing and to say, do I want to go through $5,000 worth of coaching from somebody that may or may not know what they're doing or not have a lot of life experience and not have a lot of experience with all different types of things and end up worse off like that girl, worse off than what she was when she started? Or do you want to find somebody that at a per hour price that you may have thought, you know, that's kind of expensive. And I say, think of who's in the chair. Think of who's on the other end of that phone talking to me. And what's that person worth? What are you worth? Are you worth that? Is that a small percentage in comparison? And if you get the changes that you want later on down in life and you look back and you say, what would I have paid for that? Did this guy who spent all this money and all this time learn, is he worth that value 
to pay him to help me. Some of you are going to say no. But hopefully I've gotten into some of your other brains and say, get out of the competition of the per hour. And if you really want to shift and you want to change, invest in yourself because that's what it is. It's an investment in you. And there is no better investment. Take it from a guy that's, like I said, spent several hundred thousand dollars or more. I haven't stopped keeping track after a hundred grand. And say, investing is yourself in yourself is the best investment you can make. And it doesn't have to be just about money. It, like I said, it can be about relationships and friendships. It can be about your own spiritual growth, whatever. Get in the game. Get in the game. Start this game. Start playing. Realize what's possible for your life. Realize what's possible. What's everything that you haven't considered yet in your life that's possible? Some people don't even know that's possible. We get into a call and people are, they get what they, they want and they need, but then all of a sudden something else happens and they get something they're like, oh my gosh, I, I, I didn't even know that was possible. And here I am going through this. You know, go back to the old Donald Rumsfeld thing. Sorry for the negative anchor on the Donald Rumsfeld. But he said, you know, there's, there's things that we don't know that we don't know. What is out there waiting for you that you don't even know that you don't know yet? But if you get on the path of progressing, just like anybody that's learned to play the chords and play the piano and become a great artist, B.B. Uh, King you know, died recently, um, they learned the chords, but then what did, they, what did they learn to do? They didn't know that. They didn't even know that they didn't know that when they began. But you have to take steps to get to a certain level so you can see further down the road. You're driving down the road, your headlights only go so far. But if you keep traveling, the headlights continue to be that distance. And it's safe enough that you can now travel across the country at nighttime and be able to get there. But you only go as far as the headlights go. But a lot of times you get to a certain point and you go like, I didn't even know that was there. And I didn't know that I didn't know that that was there. Get in the game. Invest in yourself, whether with me or somebody else. And start to find out more about who you are. And you'll understand why people go to coaching, why people go to therapy, why people go to seminars and stuff if you haven't already. And if you have and you're not getting the results you are, try somebody else. Don't give up on yourself. Keep going forward. I think uh, that's enough. I thought I was going to do about a seven-minute podcast today, and I'm at an hour and 15 minutes, 16 minutes. And I still got a bunch of stuff written down that I will talk about next time. Anyways, this is Mark J. Ryan with the Mark J. Ryan Experience. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast and got something out of it. If nothing else, I hope I give you a little bit of hope about your future and the possibilities that lie ahead. Expand them, open them up, go for it. Get in the game and go for it. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. For more information or if you'd like to do a coaching session with Mark, please write mark at markjryan.com. Mark, M-A-R-K, at mark, M-A-R-K, the initial J, R-Y-A-N.com. Mark at markjryan.com. Thanks for listening.